Josh, it is amazing to have you on. This has been a long time coming, one that we have been talking about having you on for such a long time. And our history goes so far back in terms of uh, how you've impacted my life. And I've talked about it on the podcast a, a couple of times, but it is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Alex, thanks for having me. Like you said, it's been a journey to get this uh, worked out scheduling wise, but uh, um, I can't wait to do it. Love catching up with you um, uh, when I can and uh, uh, really excited for this. So thank you again for having me. Absolutely. And a lot of our listeners are going to be parents who are working through trying to maintain their fitness, maintain their overall health and wellness while also taking care of children, raising them and having the best life for them. I thought that you would be an incredible example and someone who can uh, speak to this as you have three children of your own, as well as managing your own fitness alongside a tremendously busy schedule. So you are a walking example of what I believe a lot of our listeners are trying to accomplish. And I, I think that you can give a ton of insight into how you do all of those things. Yeah, uh, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, hopefully we shed a little insight in here today, uh, but it's something that it's a constant work in process, uh, progress for me uh, as well. So um, uh, definitely excited to share it because it is a passion project of mine. Um, I, I don't want to let anything go. And I know, you know, you try to squeeze all the juice out of the orange that you can, but, you know, I want to be fit and I want to be athletic. I want my career trajectory to continue to soar, but I also want to be a good dad. I want to be there when it when it matters and I want to set a good example. And I think that parents listening to this very much relate to that and also go, hey, that's really, really challenging to do. And there's going to be times where um, it's easier than others and you're going to have to overcome some things to do it. And I'm certainly uh, one of those people as well. Absolutely. So give the people a little bit of a background on you and, and your career. Walk us through kind of what your day looks like and what that all entails. Gotcha. So uh, here at the University of Southern Indiana, your alma mater, right? That's correct. Uh, uh, I am a, a teaching assistant professor. Uh, so essentially, uh, I'm a full-time faculty member within the kinesiology and sport department here. I teach four courses, which is a full-time or 12-credit hour load. Um, and uh, the only difference with my position is that uh, when you see teaching in front of it, um, it is not a tenure track position. So I'm not required to do, uh, you know, this continuous publish or perish type for my role. Um, it's I'm more judged, again, on uh, how effectively I teach, how I advise service to the university and to the community uh, in that way. So outside of the full-time faculty role, I also serve as a strength and conditioning coach in uh, athletics. And we recently transitioned to uh, Division I. Uh, and so myself and Nyla Reeder um, uh, manage the teams there. And I currently train uh, four teams. So um, uh, in that realm, I have uh, baseball, softball, women's basketball, um, and volleyball are my four teams currently. I've trained a lot of the teams at USI in some form or fashion at some point in time, uh, but that's my current lineup. And so, um, you know, uh, on a, a Tuesday or Thursday, um, I'm getting here uh, at seven to prep my interns. Uh, we'll start setting up at 715. The softball team trains from 7.30 to 8.45, and then I teach from 9 to 10.15. I teach from 10.30 uh, to 11.45. I have a brief break, office hours, and lunch, and then I teach from 1.30 to 2.45. And then depending on whether it's a Tuesday or a Thursday and where they are in season, I go out to the field for baseball to do speed and agility uh, from 3.30 to 4.30, clean up, get down around 5. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, baseball starts at 6.45. They go till 8, then women's basketball, and then volleyball ball goes at nine and then I come up and gather myself and I teach from 11 to 12 uh, and then office hours begin and uh, depending on the day I'm either meeting with Monday Wednesday Friday I meet with recruits uh, that my various teams have um, uh, different research projects that I'm on although I'm not required to do it I'm doing some research pro uh, projects right now with some faculty members um, and uh, uh, it kind of takes over from there. So yeah, that's the 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 schedule, and there's a lot in there, but uh, I w wouldn't change any of it, to be very honest with you. It's action-packed, and I imagine that a lot of the listeners' questions right now are, how do you even 
work in your own workouts. And we're going to get into that here in a second. Um, but with that busy of a schedule, has, has your schedule been that busy for a long time? Like have you been trying to work in your workouts around a busy schedule like that for an extended period? Yes. Um, it was even busier to be honest with you. So in June, no, excuse me, July, I defended my doctoral dissertation. Um, so, um, for those people who, um, are thinking about doing it, I would do it when you're 23 and 24, not when you're 36, <laughs> um, and starting that journey and then ending it when you're 40, um, because that can be particularly challenging. But, uh, you know, I, I don't say this in jest. I'm actually in a better spot now uh, that I have finished that that process uh, and don't have Wednesday night class here on campus from six to eight forty five when I would get done and then uh, turn around and have assignments due and uh, things of that nature. So yes, it, it's been uh, this process of uh, of trying to balance all the spinning plates uh, has gone on for some time, but I I really do feel like I'm in a, a good place right now. Um, and, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, can only make it better from here. Yeah. Um, wh- we should probably introduce your three incredible kiddos, uh, to the listeners as well. If you want to kind of give a short synopsis of, of all of them and what they're involved in at the moment. Yeah. So, um, I have a 10 year old daughter and, uh, she's in fourth grade and she's in softball and basketball a ton. Right. She loves sports. She is always at the weight room with me. So uh, Jules comes to every session where she's not in school uh, to be around the athletes and and loves being here. Uh, And it has been been awesome, Um, you know, uh, to see D1 athletes work how they work and to understand as a young kid that that's kind of what it takes. And we talk about whatever endeavor, if it's school. Right. If it's art, she's into art like you have to bring a certain level of enthusiasm and consistency, even on days that you don't want to. Uh, and I think that that's incredibly important. Uh, and so she's around all the time. I have a seven-year-old son named Archie, uh, uh, who is uh, in first grade. Um, and for being a, a middle child, he's the sweetest uh, human being <laughs> out there. And uh, uh, he's in Boy Scouts and a number of other activities. And uh uh, he's, uh, genuinely a pleasure to be around. And then, uh, we have my three-year-old son, Gus and, uh, Gus is, um, very, very smart. He has learned everything, both good and bad from his <laughs> older siblings. And he is smart and he is capable, uh, and he keeps us on our toes. Uh, and, uh, and Gus, he's, he's always, he asks insightful questions and you think, did that come out of a three-year-old? Uh, <laughs> And so, so there, that's where we're at. We're 10, seven and three right now. Very soon. Uh, there'll be 10, seven and four. Um, you know, and, uh, we make it all work with my wife, Mary, who also works full time as a nurse practitioner. So, uh, we, we keep it, uh, we keep it spinning at our house, man. Yeah. The action packed schedules for, for all of you. Um, and so then that leads us into how do you incorporate your, your workouts? How do you make that work with all the things the kids have going on with your busy schedule? What does that, what does that look like? So, uh, I, I would say a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, having a plan each week presents different things, you know, basketball season is now started, right? So, you know, um, uh, we're, we have basketball practice to account for along with boy scouts and, uh, different tutoring sessions and, and all that stuff going on. So the weeks can vary a little bit, uh, but Sunday, uh, and I think you may be like this too Sunday. Uh, I feel really good about enjoying my Sunday when I plan out the rest of my week, like what, what I've got going on and where I go from there. So I plan not only when do I see the windows of time that I'm going to do it, but what also is going to be the game plan if anything needs to be uh, adjusted. And the other thing is, you know, the way that I train has markedly shifted from when, you know, I trained you when you were an athlete and in high school and when I had you in college classes and when you were an intern, uh, because at that time I didn't have kids. And, um, you know, I I was a regular gym goer, you know, whether it be in the morning or the evening, you know, that was a 20 minute drive there or wherever it was and pre-workout and change your clothes and get get ready and (laughs) train for an hour, hour and a half, talk to people in the gym, get out, get a shake. Like it was a two to three hour endeavor. And that is just not feasible anymore. And to have that approach, like, well, if I don't have that time now, I can't work out. 
I went into a phase like that. Well, it's not even where it's not going to fit in today. It's just not going to work. Right. And then all of a sudden you realize it's just never going to work if you take that approach. Right. Because I, I'm not going to go get done with my day at five or six o'clock in the evening and go to the gym for two and a half hours. And I get home and it's time to read my kids books and go to bed. Right. So uh, what I have really started doing is training more frequently, but almost micro dosing those workouts. Right. Um, 30 minutes to 45 minutes extending beyond that is is really uh, out of character for me uh, at this time. Uh, but going five to six days a week with different training uh, protocols. So uh, my Tuesdays and Thursdays, since I don't start until about seven, those are morning days uh, for me. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are lunchtime uh, days for me or earlier in the morning if it works out. For example, volleyball was on the road, so I didn't have a volleyball training session this morning. So I was able to sneak that in in between things from there. Uh, and I had kind of plan that out. So um, uh, it's five days a week uh, through the weekdays. And then Saturday is a cardio of choice day, whether that be, you know, um, walking the dog for three miles or taking the kids on a hike or a nature trail or, or, or doing whatever it is. And Sunday is really my down day. Um, so, you know, we can kind of go through the the week if you want to, or kind of what the emphasis is or, or, or anything from there. But uh, that's, that's kind of how it's really changed is I'm a big time planner now. Right. And uh, the other thing is, is, you know, I'm going more frequently, but shorter doses. Right. I can do a workout from 530 a.m. to 6 a.m., get a shower in, take the kids to school. Right. And and still get to work and, and do that. Whereas that didn't seem attainable uh, early on based on, on how I trained. So with the the 30 minute workouts, um, how do you how do you get like the your warm up and then being able to get the adequate work in and then be able to you know structure that in a way that you're not putting yourself at a greater risk of injury for example by only having this finite amount of time like how do you compress it all down so what i what i do is i set a 5 minute timer when i get down my, i have a rack in my basement a weight room in my basement uh, as well as lift here at the facility at USI. But um, when I get down there, um, I put a five minute timer on. And once that timer goes on, I start, I go from low to moderate to high intensity uh, dynamic movements, anything from knee hugs to a uh, multitude of uh, multi-planar lunges uh, to squats, to, uh, you know, modified pushups to things of that nature, overhead squats, little ankle mobility. Uh, and then I kind of rev it up, uh, uh, some box jumps some power step ups, things of that nature as I start to tear up, but everything's got to be done before that five minute timer goes off. Uh, because if not, you get caught in it, you get caught on your phone, you find you're fi trying to find a different song. You're trying to, and all of a sudden 10 minutes has gone by and that's two thirds of the time, uh, that I had to train that, that day. And so, um, uh, definitely being accountable for that. You can do a lot of work in five minutes if you have a, a structured plan. And, and like I said, uh, I, I don't walk down there at five 30 and just start jumping on a box, right? That, that, that would get me hurt or, or put me at risk of it. Um, but I'll start with knee hugs and lunges and body weight squats and push ups and a couple of chin ups and use the resistance bands to, to loosen up a little bit. And then I'll go into some higher scale, uh, ankle and hip mobility work. Uh, generally that's what does me the best to get me ready to bend, yeah. uh, in, in the morning, uh, from there, uh, before I get going, but being accountable for the time and also finding what works for you. Like there's a lot of great warm up modalities out there. You have to, uh, to figure out what makes you feel good. And what makes me feel good is twofold ankle and hip mobility, because I feel like I can bend, right? I, I can get down in a really good lunge position or squat or deadlift, something of that nature. And then I also have to be primed from a neuromuscular perspective. Like I, I need a little bit of a jumping stimulus or, or something of that nature uh, before I get going, not fatiguing, uh, but, but I definitely don't want to get in there cold. And that's what works best for me. Uh, I know other people are different, uh, but really that's been a honed in thing that I've kind of crafted over time of like, when do I feel my best after I do what and make that compilation uh, of things that I can do uh, in a real feasible amount of time. Would you say that your stretching stays consistent for your, or your, your warm up 
is pretty consistent on a day to day? Yeah, it, it is fairly consistent. The only time that I would say that it is extended is, and we can get into it, but Fridays, I do athletic development, right? I'm 40 years old. I have felt myself just slowly declining and not addressing that element of lost power output, which we see in the literature that, that is going to happen uh, after about the age of 30. And Listen, I don't know that I should say this on a podcast, but about two years ago, what hit me really, really hard, and I'm telling you, this was like the ego blow of all ego blows, is they they asked me to play in a faculty student game at USI, basketball game, okay? And okay. I am not an amazing basketball player by any stretch, but I play pickup and, and active in it, and I thought, okay, this would be a really good opportunity. Uh, to go out and have some fun, some camaraderie with some some of the students that we have. They had a DJ there and a, and a good crowd and all this stuff. And I get loose on a fast break and I'm going in for a layup. And I'm telling you, a kid that was like 5'7 five, or 5'8 five, jumped up and swatted my <laughs> ball into like the ninth row. And it was on video and I got to watch the video and I realized that I jumped about six inches off the ground for that layup. And when that happened to me, like I, that was the own that was the shot of adrenaline that I needed to change the way that I train. Like I knew athleticism had gone down. I had no idea I was at that point. Um, the not, ego that hit. I, not that I can't be blocked in a basketball game, but I'm <laughs> six foot three. You know, like I've got an edge going up there, or at least perceivably so. Yeah. Okay. And 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 I am not lying one bit. The next day I started with <laughs> athletic development uh, in there. <laughs> And on those days, there is a longer ramp up. Um, yeah. You know, we can get into that if you want to. But um, as much as I think that that is a critical component for uh, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and I'm a huge proponent of it, um, uh, it does need to be a little bit more delicate in how you prepare for it because you are at a higher risk for injury, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, in the process, I have torn my calf doing, you know, really explosive sled pushes. Um, in the weight room. Uh, granted, it, it was not a, an intelligent situation. Yeah, I was trying to squeeze in between one, one group going and another group going, you know, 30 minutes later, and I just jumped on and went. Um, and, and so I set myself up uh, for that situation. But uh, yeah, we can get into the athletic development, but uh, <laughs> it's better now, brother. It is. It is better now. And uh, you can get better at age 40. I can, I can assure you that. That's, that's fantastic. The, the story of you getting swatted is <laughs> I can just, yeah. I can just see you. Uh, it, I mean, it had to be demoralizing and so much so that you got right into the athletic training the next day. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, not surprised was, by that. It was on. It was, it was definitely, it was on. Um, uh, some of my student athletes were there that I trained and again, they had it on video and they were like, wow, look at this elevation, you know? <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto Squats are bad for you. Squats are great You should needs. squat astrograms. It's fine. It fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Um, so we have the the warm up and then we have yeah. what the the training looks like. How does that kind of lay out for you? Do you have a set number of exercises that you're doing uh, on those particular days? Yeah. So, you know, uh, Monday for me is it, it sets the tone for the week. Um, and, and so I don't try to do an overwhelming, uh, quantity of different exercises. Um, it's something I talk to my athletes about all the time, being savagely good at the basics, right? Doing the basics savagely well. And so Monday is all about that. And so, uh, depending on where I am in, in my, my training plan that I've written out, uh, I'm 100% going to do a squat exercise 
on that day. Um, and that varies from back squat to front squat to, you know, a rear foot elevated Bulgarian split squat, um, you know, all the different kind of uh, a, a box squat, a pause squat, what, you know, I like to mix it up, um, but it's going to be really, really challenging. And I'm going to try to get after my two to three warm up sets um, because I need those warm up sets. I need them for for the quality purposes. Four to five uh, lower volume sets, usually six or fewer, gradually increasing in intensity uh, with the last set or two being very, very taxing. Uh, and I generally pair that with a chin up variety, a wide grip, a neutral grip, and, and I'm going to be alternating back and forth in the process. I don't think they're, uh, you know, as far as upper body movements go, I think the chin up does so much for us, so much. And I never want to lose that ability. So whether it be with the weighted vest at home that I have or using the med ball between my legs, I'm going to do a weighted variety uh, chin up, balancing that back and forth in between my warm up and mobility and warm up sets. Generally, that's my 30 to 35 minutes on that day. And I am gassed. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I joke with my students all the time. If something happens to my week, something hor- catastrophic, right? There's a family member in the hospital. I squatted and I did chin-ups that week and I got it done, <laughs> right? Like like I didn't lose Monday. And Monday is is really, really critical uh, in that way. And so that's where, where I focus on that. Uh, my Tuesday uh, when I go is, uh, I I'm going to get a higher quantity of exercises in. I'm going to push, uh, horizontally. So a dumbbell or uh, a barbell, uh, bench press, incline press, you know, something of that nature. I'm going to row, I'm going to hinge and I'm going to hit calves. So usually about four different exercises in that 30 to 40 minutes, um, uh, that we see, I'm a big proponent of, you know, resistance band, good mornings, Romanian deadlifts, uh, those types of things. I, I think it's highly critical uh, to perform those hinging movements, especially as you age, right? Like there are people who that, that come to me that, you know, I work with on the side, they can't hinge, right? And it's a, so I, I try to make that a, a priority um, uh, as well as I go through there. So the quantity goes up there. Wednesday is uh, a cardio day. Right. And so it's it's a down day as far as strength training goes. It's an up day as far as putting the emphasis uh, on cardiovascular health. And I mix the modalities a lot. I uh, and I think people should. And, you know, I, I know you recently did a half marathon. Mm-hmm. I did one a couple of years back. Congratulations, because Thank for you. strength guys like us. I don't know if there's a bigger challenge. <laughs> it was very difficult. I, I really don't. So kudos <laughs> to you, man. Thank you. Um, that that's that's terrific. Um, but unless you're training for an endeavor like that, I think it's positive uh, to mix up the modality. So uh, I'm a big rowing machine fan. Why? Because after two days of, you know, kind of hitting different aspects of the legs, the wear and tear isn't isn't there. I love a rowing machine. Uh, light, love an aerodyne bike. Uh, did a treadmill interval sprints this morning. That was that was the work this morning. But I'm going to mix it up. Um, in the summer, I have a little bit more free time than I do normally. I still have training groups, still teach summer school, but it's um, uh, way down. And, and and we got this brand new pool at USI. I don't know if you know, we have this like aquatic center now. Wow. Um, and so I'll swim uh, on Wednesdays in, in the summer. So mixing that modality up and generally shoot for 25 minutes is at the minimum. And that's if it's really high intensity stuff upwards to about 45 minutes. And I have found that that really helps my recovery process. If my sleep and nutrition are good, it helps me get into Thursday. I'm actually better that I move than, than if I'm sedentary on that Wednesday uh, in between. Okay. Uh, so that, that's that been a really good thing for me. And like I said, mixing it up. If my knees are hurting, it's a rowing machine day, right? Like it just, uh, I'm going to go on feel for that. Uh, uh, Thursday, uh, I try to be multi-planar and, and try to kind of fit in things that, that I don't normally do. You know, uh, so much of how I grew up training is sagittal plane, right? So squats and bit, like l- forward step lunges. What I'm doing is I'm doing lateral lunges, roller lateral lunges, uh, lunges with med ball rotations, right? Uh, this multi-planar nature uh, uh, of training is something that I neglected early on in my career, uh, worried about uh, certain performance metrics on, on certain lifts, right? 
Um, and now uh, I want the ability to rotate, right? I, I do rotational med ball throws and uh, things of that nature. So that's that's really where my Thursdays uh, come in at. It's generally going to be two to three lower body exercises, uh, but they're complementary. They can go fairly quick, like a, a a lateral lunge or a lunge matrix, something of that nature. Uh, a leg curl, a calf touch on that, and then I'll do um, some varying rotational work uh, for the upper body uh, as well. And again, something that I neglected. Uh, or early on. Um, but you see that that part goes away really quickly when you're not doing athletics every day. Mm -hmm. And then Friday is kind of what we talked about. Um, based on the stimulus of two years ago, uh, athletic development and man, athletic development, uh, for a guy in their thirties, now me in my forties, I think it's so critical because it falls off so quickly. You don't really realize where it goes, um, and so what I've really talked myself into, Alex, is make it fun, make it, make it fun, whatever the thing is that you're going to do, make it fun. So, you know, this summer it was stacking up the boxes and seeing how high I could go box jump wise um, and adding in sprint work uh, at the end of that. And, and to me, to see those boxes rise and again, I don't want anybody in your audience thinking, oh, you're talking to a 40 year old with a 40 inch <laughs> vert. That is not the case. <laughs> right. But to go from, you know, where I was jumping on a box that was a combined 18 inch and 12 inch. So we're talking 30 inch box jump. My first week of the summer when I, I kind of put my sights on that challenge uh, to being able to add 12 inches by the end of the summer, jumping for multiple sets of five. I feel really, really good about that, right? Like that, that makes me feel like I have that element back. Sprinting, doing rotational work, doing some resisted running against bands, doing broad jumps, right? Mm -hmm. And then the sprinting thing. And uh, man, uh, I'm sure as much as you're online and, and working, you saw the stat that came out a couple of months ago. Um, and, and I have done some investigating. It's unsighted, but I don't actually doubt the validity of it, which it says after the age of 30, uh, 95 percent of people don't sprint. Right. Yeah. Now, that's anecdotal. Right. Um, so let's be clear about that. That's not there's no published research study on that, but it really got me thinking. Um, and, and I. And you know what I started doing is I started asking my brother-in-laws, my friends, my the people who I know exercise but are in my age demographic. Like, and I would start it like this. I'd say, when's the last time you ran like somebody picked up your kid and was taking him away or like a bear was chasing you? And I'm telling you, that stat is, is probably not 100% accurate, but it's darn close because most of the people looked at me and were like, I, I couldn't tell you when. And to ramp yourself into sprinting again, like I hate to say this, like on a public podcast, it was scary. I was like, yeah. you know, about 85, 90% going like, do you try to go all out on this? Like go and and you couldn't go any faster. Um, and it's something that I've been been working into. But it, I mean, you feel fantastic afterwards. Uh, I, it's, it, it is definitely something that, uh, you know, like I love to play football in the yard with my kids. And I like to run them down, right? Like I like to dunk over my kids on, I bought one of those gorillas because I always wanted to go to two bit bandit here in Evansville where you could hang on the rims. Yeah. So I just bought one for my house. So now I can, I can do it all, man. But like, I don't want to lose that. And I don't want to ever be so like now at my age, guys are in my friend group and we're on these group chats and it's like, who wants to play pickup basketball on Saturday morning? And the overwhelming thing is like, no, I'll tear my Achilles. No, yeah. I'll tear my ACL. Like you can't get guys our age to go play. They're afraid to go play. And it's because they know that that has, that has gone and that maximal exertion it is going to put them at risk, you know? And for me, like, man, I, I'm really going to have a hard time when I lose the ability, when I can't go play in a pickup basketball game. Um, and I'm going to bring it to the faculty and staff game this year, by the way. <laughs> when, um, when is that? Uh, April, April. Um, and so, uh, you know, I get some shots in with my daughter out, out there and, and yeah. at basketball practice, but, uh, listen, athleticism is going to be on high, uh, in April. And so, uh, if you're a college student at the university of Southern Indiana, watch out. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's going to be better. No, uh, he's I very serious. Everybody. He's very, <laughs> he's very, <serious. laughs> uh, uh, 
I guess the the question that comes to mind as you're talking about the sprinting, if someone is in their 30s and 40s and they haven't sprinted in a long time, uh, we can go back and forth on this. How would you recommend that they start to incorporate or work their way towards a sprint? Absolutely. So number one, get the room to do so, whether it be outside or, you know, I think if you have a standard basketball court, especially if you have a little bit of room, you know, on the baselines, uh, that that is good. But I 100% do not recommend going full throttle right out of the gate. Um, You know, for me, it was a gradual process of telling myself that I wanted to, I started slow. And I think that that's important. So, uh, you know, I would do a fall forward, a practice that I use with my athletes to get into a forward lean sprint position, and then a knee drive forward, grabbing the ground with a ball of foot. And I would concentrate on those mechanics and then gradually speeding up till I got to the end of the court. And by the time I got to the end of the court, I was probably at 60 to 70 percent. I'm not going to lie to you. I spent the first two to three weeks doing that. And really, at the end, I might push myself a little bit more, right? Like kind of ramp into it uh, a little bit. And and the adaptations took place. Uh, you know, I would start feeling more and more comfortable, less apprehension when I moved the intensity up. Um, and then on the day of, you know, that was my, you know, ninth sprint of the day, 10th sprint when I did let go and go to 90, 95%, um, intensity. Uh, but it was a definitely a gradual build in process, right? Um, uh, you know, muscle contraction speed is something that we don't, I don't think give a lot of, uh, thought process to, uh, when we talk about training adaptations and, and the fact that our body adapts to recruiting the motor units that are most advantageous for whatever activity. And that is a central nervous system adaptation, right? Rather than a muscular one, obviously the muscles are going to pull on the joints and, and make everything happen, but the synchronization, the firing rate, right? Innervating those motor neurons, like all of that kind of comes with a gradual ramp up and you're going to feel better with it. And I think that mentally the apprehension goes away when you gradually are able to get to higher and higher speeds. And I still ramp into my sprints, meaning I fall forward and lean in. Like it's not like a whistle and I, I take off and I'm a hundred percent. Um, and I, I think that's advantageous because you still get this sprint stimulus. I'm just not going like, you know, uh, from zero to a hundred right away, right. There's a ramp. And that's where I say it, it works to have space, mm-hmm. right. Um, that you can kind of ramp into, to that situation. I don't know how you feel about that, that, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts in bringing someone into that, but in working with people in my age demographic, and I don't do a, you know, a large amount of personal training with my career. Um, but, that's how I've approached it. Um, interested to hear your thoughts. So for myself, it it's interesting because everyone has such a different background of their experience in sprinting. Like I, I've worked with clients who have had zero athletic background and they're now in their thirties or early forties and wanting to start sprinting. And that is a challenging skill to teach via the internet and and not being there in person and, and having to set up the the drills and those things to create the coordination. And uh, the coordination is the biggest part as well as just the confidence that you have the ability to plant and drive off of uh, the footing and so on. Um, so there are, are drills that I may run through for someone who has zero experience, um, but utilizing the ramp up period. I, I like utilizing if someone's able to get on a track being able to take the straightaways at a you know ramping up as they're getting towards the end being at their top speed uh, and then using the the curves as more of a walking and then they're just taking it from a walk as it starts to get to a straightaway they're starting to build from the walk to a light jog to a little bit of a, a quicker jog and then just continuing to pace that way um, I find that to be a useful tool for some clients who are wanting to get a little bit more sprint work in place. And that's what I ended up doing for a lot of my sprint work that I did for the half marathon training that I just completed. 
Uh, if there, and I'll be honest, if there was a session that I ended up being like, ah, eh, this is not going to happen this week. I'm too busy. It was the sprint session. I found the most excuses for the sprint sessions. I was okay with the eight, nine, 10 mile runs. Um, but then the sprint sessions were far more difficult than any of the distance work that I was doing, which is uh, a testament to what we're speaking about today anyway, of the, probably the reason to do it. It's so true, man. Yeah. It, it like the, the, uh, the conversation you have with your shoes when you're about ready to put them on to go do that, <laughs> it has to be one of the wildest mental gymnastics, um, uh, to do it. And you know what the hilarious part is, you know, you talk about running 10 miles or, or do, you know, whatever else uh, that it is, is most of my sprint sessions or like plyometric sessions that I do. I mean, once I'm warmed up and ready last 20 minutes, like you are not sprinting long. Yeah. The stimulus is incredibly high. The benefits are, are unworldly when you compare them to, you know, other types of training. And you know that like me, a guy that teaches exercise science, I know that I'm seeing it more and more come out in the literature, the benefits of these high intensity bursts and the effects that we see not only on the anaerobic system, but, you know, interval based work of the, the VO2 max going up, right? Like you're like, how efficient is it that I can get done in 20 minutes versus running 10 miles, but it's still an epic mental challenge to do that 20 minutes versus that two hours. And, and I guess the other thing I would add for, for clients that I've worked with that will use more of a, um, like a, a bike to get some like more intense rounds in or the rower, it's just an easier setup for them and a much lower risk of, of possible injury in relation to getting them to do sprints when they maybe haven't sprinted in forever. So we work on the skill coordination of that, but then use the intensity work to be more with the bike or the the rower, which is really helpful. Alex, you're absolutely right. That's a great, I, that great concept because, you know, when we have injured athletes, right. And maybe we can get them on the rowing machine or we can get them somewhere else. Like it, you can do that high intensity type of training, shorter relative work intervals, provide the rest or, or at least, you know, low intensity exercise with it. But you're right that the assault bike, the, the, the rower, th those are great points of, you know, if somebody wants to incorporate that intensity, especially early on, um, fantastic uh, modifications that are much safer long term, right? And there might be some 22 year olds listening to this podcast going like, they've mentioned getting hurt a lot, <laughs> right? Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's the, the nature of it. And, and I can tell you as a guy that's as addicted to training as I am, uh, when I tore my calf about a year ago, um, listen, mentally, it tore me up more than it did physically, because I have not had that long of a hiatus off of training the way that I am. Um, and it affected all parts of my life. Uh, and, uh, and not so much that it was a, you know, a detriment, I couldn't do my job, I couldn't be a dad, but there was a there was a noticeable element missing. And like, uh, there were times I worked with the USI athletic training staff. Uh, they did a phenomenal job at at giving me treatment, giving me rehabilitation exercises. They were fantastic. But they were also an accountability partner because even down there in that boot, they would walk by the weight room, knock on the window and be like, get out of there. <laughs> right. Like because I was trying it, you know, yeah. like um, and not not that I'm some super tough guy, man. Like I, I really mentally, uh, strength training does a lot for me. It, yeah. it really puts me in a great frame of mind. I love it when I can get it in the morning. It sets the tone positive. I feel like I've accomplished something. I'm feeling good. I'm, uh, those, those vibes are going to go out to other people. Uh, and it's really a, a, a noticeable missing element. I mean, we all know the chemical and the dopamine response that, that we get from it. Uh, but it's, it really is a, a, uh, a tremendous part of, of my day-to-day -day life that I value. And when that's taken away, because you do something like grab a heavy sled 20 minutes in between training sessions with no warm up, thinking that, that you can, you know, drive that thing through a brick wall and, uh, end up on the ground and, and out for six to eight weeks, it yeah. really puts your training into perspective because that's time I won't get back. Uh, and, 
and frankly, there was such a rebuilding process that had to go on, especially lower extremity wise uh, after that process. Yeah, the the stress mitigation that it allows for a lot of us to have, I, I, I would imagine that a lot of people who are listening probably became more aware of this when we went through the pandemic and gyms closed and then they realized like, oh man, I, I don't have stress coping mechanisms or things that I can work through because I use the gym as my main driver. I know that that was for myself. Um, and it's just such a, it's a positive thing. It's something that allows for you to get checked off, feel accomplished and be pushed and, uh, be able to work through fatigue and discomfort and come out on top and, and set PRs. And there's just so much positive that comes with it, uh, and has been such a, strong mission for us over the last, you know, this is December will be year 10 of us uh, doing this online and, and uh, with physique development, serving clients and so on. Uh, it's just been a big mission for us to showcase that it can be done in so many different ways, but it needs to be done regardless of, of where you're at. And we can meet you where you are, uh, just depending on what you have accessible to you, what time we have available, and we can make something work uh, because it's going to build the momentum for them to be in better shape. And I think that a lot of people get caught up in what they have been told in the past or what they have done in the past. And it's like, well, I can't do that. And uh, so I'm not going to do anything at all. And you, you briefly talked about that. Um, having the I, training I went through prior. a funk like that, man. I was like, yeah. You know, when I had, when, when those kids were babies, especially, you know, and, and there's limited sleep and there's, you know, there, these other things that, that come into play, you're like, well, I, it's not, I can't even get a training session in today. And then a well, one day turns into a week, which turns into a month and, and, and things really get out of control. And, and, and so, uh, definitely, uh, can sympathize with people who fall into that. But, but what I think we're here to tell you is, is, it doesn't have to be that way. And mm -hmm. you can do very, very effective training in short amounts of time. If you plan it, if you have guidance from, you know, your team, right? Like that, it can work. Um, and uh, like you mentioned, like when I'm done in the morning and it's six 30 or seven o'clock, I'm like ready, like ready to take on the day, right? Like it just gives you a different perspective uh, that that's so positive. Uh, from there. And I do think that I should publicly mention that you guys have done amazing. What, what, what you guys have done, and I know Sue has played a major role. It's great that when you came in and talked to my classes that I was able to meet her in person. Um, what you guys have done with physique development is absolutely amazing, right? It, it's, it's, it's so phenomenal. And I hate to say this, but uh, and I've shared this with you before, but just to your listeners, when this originally, you were in my class when you guys started this, I was like, there's no way that works. Online training. So like, you're going to train people online because I'm so dogmatic coming from that, you know, uh, you know, a uh, high school and collegiate team. You got to be in there. You're signing off their last set and watching it. And I'm like, how in the world is this ever going to work? Right. Uh, and I'm not proud of it because I love you and, and you, you've, you know, you've been a great intern. You've been a st great student. You've been a great athlete, but I didn't think it was going to work. Like, like I'm just going to be very honest with you and to see what it has built into. Um, and also to go through the pandemic and then be at home in my basement, training my athletes and them getting it in. Like it registered at that time. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like you can do this. It's harder. It's different. It's, it is, it is a different way of doing things. But, oh, my God, like, you know, that's a look back and go like, what were you thinking that that couldn't be done now? How much how, what, what percentage of fitness is delivered online? Right. Right. And so anyway, I was wrong, Alex, um, <laughs> about that. I'm glad that that I didn't deter you oh my gosh. Uh, uh, in any way, uh, shape or form. Uh, but uh, what a fantastic thing you've built and, and kind of giving people those tools uh, to do so, because we, we all need a, a little bit of guidance, a little bit of structure uh, to find what's going to work for us. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing, turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty? I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. 
we just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Well, thank you for that. And I, uh, I have talked about this on the podcast, but uh, you were really the first person to give me like the, the opportunity, I suppose, within resistance training uh, to show me how much I could love it and the way that you had structured it out and making it um, s- scary, but also fun and something that I could, it was so quantifiable and that was appealing to me and I could see progress and it was, uh, you know, it me you were a catalyst in me even getting all this started. So I'm endlessly appreciative of you. And I can tell a, a small story. We're kind of pivoting out of our uh, oh, training yeah, as a parent. No, no, it's okay. Me. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a, it, it's good for the listeners to hear this as well. Um, is that when I, when we first, we, you started training us, I think when I was in eighth grade, you would come mm-hmm. to the, the junior high and you would have us do uh, our workouts there and we would have to sign off on our last exercise and our or sign off on our last set of like the bench press or the squat or whatever the movement was for that particular day as a priority. I still do that to this day. That's a Josh Wildeman hallmark. Yeah. Right? Like I don't even know where it kind of started, but yes, yes. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. And so at the, at the beginning then, I was uh, maybe 110 pounds, 115 pounds, maybe at the most. And I was certainly the weakest of all my friends. And so I did everything in my power to hide from Josh throughout the entire session, hoping that we would get to the end of the workout and it would just be like, darn it, you didn't get to sign off on your on your last set. Um, but you always made your point to find me. Even as much as I tried to hide in that gym and get to the opposite corner of you, you always pushed me to get that last set checked off, even though I felt like I was the weakest person there or I was not near as strong as my friends and I was embarrassed and so on. Um, it gave me such a strong foundation to working out and just staying accountable to it. And then from there, I would take those workouts and then I would go to Bob's gym on my own time and I would do the workout again because I was like, I don't feel, I feel embarrassed to do it here and my friends are stronger than me, so on. So I'm going to do this on my own time by myself in my quote unquote privacy of my own head, basically. And that allowed for me to kind of get into a little bit of a better spot. Uh, and I was fortunate to have you continue coaching me as we went through high school sports and everything. Yeah, it's a, it's really a remarkable story, like our history together. Uh, and, and, you know, there's not a lot of, of kids who are in the 14, 15 age range that are going to do a workout, be self-conscious about it, and then actually do something about it. Yeah. They'll be self-conscious about it. But, you know, for you to go to Bob's gym and go, Hey, I'm just going to get better at all this. So I'm not, you know, embarrassed around my friends, you know, I'm not, you know, and, and look at some of your friends, like you had some genetic freaks in That's high it. school. Yeah. I, you know, lo- looking back, you, you surrounded yourself with intimidating folks, uh, that were just, uh, really, really blessed genetically. But, uh, you know, that, that is a, a tremendous, uh, asset to have to kind of overcome, you know, that adversity, uh, in, in that process. And I think it's really, really important to teach the youth strength training, not because I love it so much. But but I'm being very genuine when I say it teaches you so much about yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, I had you at Castle High School. I taught there eight years and I came out at night and taught at the University of Southern Indiana. And it just so happened that, you know, they offered me a full time teaching job. I had got my master's degree and I I could come in and be a faculty member here. And then, oh, lo and behold, you transfer in uh, at USI and I have you again. So having this remarkable experience of having a kid who is you know, shy, which you were, mm-hmm. you know, when you were eighth grade, freshman year, uh, uh, small, and then see you blossom into this, you know, and go through college and then to have you in class and then to have you as an intern. Um, you were also an intern for the 
uh, USI softball division two national championship team. I think mm-hmm. we should, we, we should, should mention, that. um, uh, for, for that. Uh, and, uh, but w- going back to kids is like, you know, how many emails I get from students and they're not athletes that were like, strength training changed my life because I did something hard. I overcame it and I got better. And I, my self-efficacy, my self-confidence, um, I don't know whether this says a good thing or a bad thing about me, but, uh, I have not been at Castle High School in over a decade. I've been here at the University of Southern Indiana. And I tell you, I get at least one email a month, if not multiple. And very rarely are they from student athletes. They're from students I had in the general plan class that are like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I got promoted to sergeant uh, in, in the Army. And, you know, uh, I was, you know, smoking weed before I came to your class and you wouldn't let me get in the squat rack high and you pushed me and told me I could get stronger. And, you you know, like all of a sudden I went from being this self-conscious kid who did these things to getting jacked. And then I was like, well, what do I do? My grades are, are crap. And I went to the military and now I have a career, mm-hmm. right? Like it, and again, like that kid had to put in the work, but it's like, so many times we put kids in math and science and, and all these things, but they don't build the self-efficacy, the, the ability to go like, I can overcome this and I can get better at this and, and build the self within. And strength training does that, especially for novices, because thankfully for me, when I started out with you guys, it's really hard to screw up novice strength training. <laughs> you know, yeah. I look back at some of the programs that I did and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, there are copies of this still floating around somewhere and I would (laughs) never do it this way, you know, 18 years later. Yeah. However, here's the deal. When you're young, you need mechanical tension, metabolic stress and muscle damage. And if you can do that with good form and, and, you know, properly uh, balance it out, eh, you can do a lot of damage with a 14 year old kid with testosterone flowing through their veins. You know, you don't yeah. have to be a rocket scientist. Now, now my, uh, my programs are much more intentional and detailed and, and specified. And, and, you know, I was young, I was 22, 23 years old doing that. Uh, you know, and I had a lot of testosterone going, yeah, you know, like we had some raucous environments in that, in that weight room. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, so that's that's why I think it's incredibly important for for uh, for kids to get that exposure, because I think it can do more than make you strong. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I'm very, very passionate about that. And I'm looking at ways to be very honest with you now, this doctor has done to to recapture that, so to speak. I love working with athletes and mm-hmm. I, I will hopefully work with athletes for a long, long time. But like, what about the kids that are on the fringe, man? Like if that could be your lasting legacy that, you know, you took five kids who were on the fringe and you gave them the confidence and and work ethic to not even just be a a strong person, but to pursue their goals. Like that's one heck of a legacy, in my opinion, Um, certainly not going to get a town named after me or anything. But but I think about that a lot. And those emails that come in, I think about them a lot. I save them all. Um, And this is this is really silly. But on bad days, I go through them. No, I have a bad day with a team. Yeah. I go, I have this favorite email folder and I go through them and I'm like, there's a reason that you do this. There's, there's a reason this matters, you know? Uh, and, and unfortunately you got to remind yourself that sometimes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I have the exact, I have a folder here of just, I call it the good stuff. And so I'll click that. Uh, it's just a folder of screenshots of emails that people have sent and, and uh, different things that just make me realize that what I, you know, crappy day today is not as uh, bad as it feels. And I do amazing work and, and so on. So it's nice to have that little folder to tap into and, and remember. Um, I, you know, it was it was a catalyst in in my overall confidence in general. It was kind of like it pulled me out of of being that shy kid and uh, getting and it it elevated my ability within the sports that I was playing. Um, it elevated just my the the friendships that I had because of the camaraderie that we were able to build in the weight room. The music is loud. We're pushing each other. We want everyone else to succeed. Everyone's trying to lift the other person up. We have a competitive environment, but an encouraging one at the same time. It's a very cool to have that. Even, even when you would be teaching, like when we were in high school, you would have the classes during the day that people would come in and strength train as one of their, uh, their classes. And, 
that would still be a cool environment, uh, provided that everybody wanted to, you know, contribute or wanted to be there. That's a big, <laughs> big factor. Yeah. But um, that was also cool to have in place. And I think it's such a, an important part for everyone, as we've talked about throughout this, uh, to take these opportunities to lift and, and to, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of people that I've worked with that have had no opportunity to train with other people. They, f they started fitness or they started to resistance train as they were an adult. And so they just went into the gym for the first time and they were learning everything from online. And I really think that those people miss out a bunch by not having a training partner or not being able to, to train in a team setting. And I realize how, uh, rare that actually is. It is. It, it's a, it's a great environment. Um, it makes it a, a lot of fun. It's motivate even on days where you don't feel like bringing it, you bring it right. Mm -hmm. Like, it, you know, um, and, and I talk about it in my classes when we discuss exercise techniques, um, uh, I I'm going through and I touch on, okay, how does a power lifter bench press differently than a conventional, you know, bench press or a traditional bench press? Like, what are they trying to manipulate? Like, what are they trying to do? Okay. How does a CrossFitter do this? And when I bring it up, I, I always mention with CrossFit, like it or not like it, I'm neutral on the subject. Um, uh, I think it has its positives for, for wh whatever, uh, uh, for many benefits for people, but it's not for everybody. That's kind of where I am with it. But one thing CrossFit did is they put people in a gym together. They made it competitive. They made it loud and they made it fun. And, and they won that, right? Like there, that is a distinguishable characteristic that they capitalized on. Yeah. They, they, they have figured out the community part of it. That's the main gyms have are never going to figure out because everyone's there doing their own thing, so on. And so that's how they were able to, and the same thing goes for things like Orange Theory or F45 is that people, the workouts are fine. They're not yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm neutral the on that is, stuff. Like yeah, the community is huge. And then having people around them, encouraging them, having someone there, some better than others who are able to, uh, give them feedback on how they're doing the specific things, the exercises, how they're running, whatever it is, those things are are helpful. But the community is the thing that a lot of people have lacked in their fitness journey. And, and I would love to create a, something that would allow for that to be stronger, but it's, it's a difficult thing to do because you have to be there in person. You do, you do. And it, it's challenging. It's challenging. Just like I outlined with my schedule, like, you know, <clears throat> I plan that on Sunday, there's going to be different variables each week good luck trying to find someone who matches your variables and can go at your house at five o'clock in the morning and can go, um, you know, at, at the athletic facility in between sessions at 1 PM on a Wednesday. Exactly. Right. Like it's, and so you do, you lose that element of it. So you're right. If, if people don't have that initially, it can be a daunting, intimidating thing, uh, uh for them. So, uh, definitely recognize that for sure. Yeah. The last, last question I have for you is that back in the day you were having your nutrition was these homemade protein bars that I can remember as well as beef jerky. So it was like homemade protein bars, beef jerky, and just slamming both of those. And, uh, what you would have, you would encourage me to do as I was rail thin and trying to somehow put on a little bit of muscle and a little bit of overall weight was peanut butter and jelly and, uh, chocolate milk. And I slammed yep. a lot of those. So I was curious if you have graduated from the beef jerky and homemade protein bars, or you're still rocking with those. So my nutrition has improved because of my wife. <laughs> uh, Same here. <laughs> my, uh, you know, uh, so I am not immune to those things that, that you just mentioned. Uh, but I will say that I have graduated to making sure that my, the protein supplement that I take, if I, if I do a shake afterwards, um, is definitely something that, um, is quantifiable. Okay. How many grams am I getting in? What's the calories? Like I don't need a bunch of extra calories. So I need to be smart, uh, about that. Uh, I still love beef jerky, but I have transitioned. Uh, I I'm away from any processed beef jerky. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I'm a big proponent of like the shaved steak that's dried. Um, you know, uh, we get a cow, every year, a grass fed cow now. Uh, so we actually get that on November 5th. So that's coming up. Um, and then our neighbor is a deer hunter and will get us, um, uh, a deer. And so we do so much of natural, um, as far as, uh, uh trying to, to get quality meat sources. And really that's where, 
where it comes from um, is is focusing on that. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll do a protein shake if I don't have time to do a, a full meal following a workout. Um, I'm a creatine guy. I think that that's um, like to see the studies I shared with my class the other day about the cognitive benefits of creatine. Yeah. Again, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm an education doctor, right? Um, so if it's contraindicated in any way by your physician or an allergy or something of that nature, but really that stuff's been studied for 40 to 50 years. And all it is is good for, I would say, the vast majority of people. So um, the only thing that's really changed is, uh, you know, I used to eat processed beef jerky by the bundle load. And once you realize that there's a lot of plastic in there and other things that are jammed in there, you go, listen, I'd rather have some deer jerky. I'd rather have some shaved steak. Um, I'm a big fan of, of, of those things, uh, and doing protein in that way. Um, and then, like I said, we're really careful with where we get our meat from. Mm. Like it's, um, it, it's a very intentional effort. And I'll be honest with you without my wife, it's not there. She has spearheaded this entire thing. Um, you know, she's been really conscientious about what we give our kids. Um, because when you look around and see how much processed stuff, and I'll just give you an example. We used to, we are, we still do, but we used to get salmon, uh, once a week we, we would do salmon and, uh, my wife got this salmon a while back and I was like, "Hun, this looks a little like red, like, mm. like red, red. She's like, I know, because it's wild caught and it actually has to swim upstream. And the farm stuff that we were getting was injected with pink dye, right? Wow. And so you see it dripping out of there when you pull it out of the package now and you go, that's what we were feeding. Like, so we're just a lot more cognizant of that now, you know? Um, <clears throat> So I would say my only real detriments are uh, the fact that if you remember, caffeine is a, a I'm a, I'm a caffeine junkie. <laughs> That's both um, of us. Yeah. I tell people I run on uh, protein, caffeine and creatine. <laughs> um, and uh Oh my gosh. You know, I, I just, I, that's, that's the thing. So um, yeah, that's how it's changed. I, I am a little bit uh, uh, better about it now, but I got to give credit to my wife, Mary, because, you know, she's gotten a lot of the seed oils and the other stuff out. You know, we're out on the Blackstone. We got the avocado oil going <laughs> um, and, and all that stuff. And it's all a really good thing because, you know, uh, as she's discussed uh, with our kids of like, they're not going to eat healthy if they don't have the option to eat healthy and right. they're not going to learn what good food is and what feeling good is unless we do it for them. They're 10, seven and three, right? Like we are setting the tempo for what their expectations are. And we're setting the example in how we exercise and how, when my wife wants to go downstairs and work out and it's six o'clock at night, how I don't give her a hard time and go, really? I just got home from work. I've been in the facility on my feet for 12 hours and you want to go downstairs stairs and now I have these three kids and food prep. No, it's important for her to go downstairs, right? She needs it for all the benefits that we've outlined in this entire podcast. Plus, you know what our kids are going to inevitably do? They're going to go down and have to ask mom a question. And when they go down and ask mom a question, they're going to see her working out and they're going to see the value that we put on it. And, uh, you know, my grandpa always said the, the old saying more is caught than taught. And, and, and what we're trying to do, and we're not always perfect, right? We have Halloween coming up. Our kids are going to eat copious amounts of candy for that one day. <laughs> but what we're we're trying to do from a more habitual standpoint is set them up for success. When, when they leave our house, they'll ultimately make the choice of how they're going to do different things, right? Um, but I don't want them to look back and go like, all I was fed was this, this, and this. And I don't even have a palate that eats salmon or orange roughy or steak or, you know, uh, those types of things. So, man, yeah. I took that question way over <laughs> no. what you wanted right there, I'm sure. But yeah, that's... Uh, no, I thought it was a tremendously helpful. And I, I think that uh, the listeners will benefit greatly from this episode. We've got a lot of things that we can have you back on for uh, because I'd love to have you back. And, and we could probably do an entire episode episode on creatine and giving everyone the details of what research we found and what benefits we see for ourselves and so on. I, I'm sure that they would enjoy that. And if Absolutely. I, I think that it's, man, I tell my classes, I'm like, listen, 
if you could do one thing today, supplementation wise, it, it's go and do that. And yeah. so, yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for, for having me on here today, man. Uh, I, I forget we're recording, so I apologize if there are any errors. I just <laughs> fun catch up, right? And, uh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, talk shop and see where you guys are at uh, and, and what your thoughts are uh, on certain things. So uh, uh, tremendous, tremendous to catch up with you and let's do this again, okay? Absolutely. Uh, thank you guys for listening. And if you guys have any questions or things that we can address in the next episodes, let us know in the form below and we'll see you in the next episode.